What's up, everybody? It's Saturday. The Knolls are about to kick off, but we've had a lot of questions about the Attorney General's response to Murdoch's jury tampering, quote unquote, new evidence and reason that he believes a new trial is necessary. So in the process right now, we are waiting to hear from the appellate court if they're even going to allow Murdoch the chance to have an evidentiary hearing. So let's listen to what the AG says in their response. See if they think the whole motion is BS. See if they think the legal standard is different than Murdoch's team, that there needs to show that there's an overturning of the verdict based on the tampering by the clerk, cur court clerk, whether they think there even was any tampering by the court clerk and what they think should happen next. Hit that like button if you haven't already for a Saturday video. It's unusual. I mean, we've had more lately than we used to, but Saturday video, always fun. Thanks for being here. Subscribe if you haven't already. Let's get into it here. On September 5th, 2023, appellant moved pursuant to Rule 29B to suspend his appeal and grant leave to file a motion for a new trial based on a blend of mixed allegations broadly directed at the Colleton County Clerk of Court, Rebecca Hill. Respondent would show as follows. A motion for new trial based on after-discovered evidence may not be made while the case is on appeal unless the appellate court, upon motion, has suspended the appeal and granted leave to make the motion, which they did try to do, Murdoch's team. There can be no doubt that motions of this sort should be received with the utmost caution because, as it is said by a learned judge, there are but few cases tried in which something new may not be hunted up and also because it tends to perjury, meaning to create situations where people can lie after the fact and change the facts, um, which maybe is going to be alleged in this case. Uh, and therefore, we can't have that happen. You only get one bite at the apple type of deal. It would have a mischievous tendency after all the evidence on the part of the state had been fully disclosed to allow one with his life in danger an opportunity by the assistance of Confederates to procure unprincipled witnesses to contradict the evidence on the part of the state and thereby defeat the ends of justice. So basically what they're saying is part of this protection is so that we don't have situations where a defendant pays off a witness or pays off a juror after they've already made the decision. Here's a million bucks, flip your vote, tell them that you were going to vote not guilty, but somebody you know pressured you into voting guilty. We do not want that in our justice system. May sound obvious, but it's worth saying and worth mentioning. To prevail on his request to suspend the appeal and have the matter remanded to the circuit court to proceed on a motion for a new trial based on after-discovered evidence, appellate must show, one, the evidence in question is such as will probably change the results if a new trial is granted. So there's a difference here in the standard. The AG's office is trying to argue that it has to change the results or probably change the results. Two, the evidence has been discovered since the trial. Three, the evidence could not have been discovered prior to the trial by the exercise of due diligence. So two and three, they have those, Murdoch's team. Four, the evidence is material to the issue of guilt or innocence. Maybe, maybe not. And five, the evidence is not merely cumulative or impeaching. It's not. The movement must show that he did not know of the evidence, existence of such evidence at the time of the trial and that he used due diligence to discover such evidence or that he could not have discovered it by the exercise of due diligence. A prima facie showing of these factors is necessary before a remand to the circuit court can be granted. So they're saying Murdoch's team has to show all five of those factors before it should even go back for the evidentiary hearing. Additionally, it is essential to the consideration of a motion for a new trial based on after-discovered evidence that such motion shall be supported by an affidavit of the accused himself unless a valid and sufficient reason for the omission to file such an affidavit is shown. The uh, affidavit of the accused must show that he did not know of the existence of such evidence at the time of the trial and that he used due diligence to discover such evidence or that he could not have discovered it by the exercise of due diligence. An affidavit of the appellant's counsel showing these matters is not sufficient. So we have not seen an affidavit from Alec Murdoch himself saying he didn't know about this evidence. Now, I think it's pretty obvious that they didn't know about this evidence prior to the trial. Um, I think it's obvious that no discovery or due diligence would they have ever found this evidence. Now, the interesting distinction here is, does it need to be evidence that would change the outcome? Murdoch's team says no, because it's jury tampering by the clerk, court clerk. And if that exists at all, that's enough to, shed a cat, uh, to cast a shadow of doubt over this verdict. 
The way I read the case law they presented, I think that is correct. Now, this motion made by the AG is also correct in that a motion for new trial based on new evidence, that new evidence usually does have to cast doubt on the verdict. So what's interesting about this is, or it has to show, I should say, that there'd be a different verdict. So what this usually is, like these five factors that the AG's office is, is digging into here is usually like new DNA evidence. Well, the technology didn't exist. We couldn't have tested it. Now we can. We have found this new evidence. The defendant can say we didn't know about this new evidence, but it proves he's innocent. That's what you need. A smoking gun, a video that shows somebody else committing the crime that you could not have gotten before. That's new evidence that obviously shows the outcome is probably wrong, but that's very different than jury tampering by the court clerk and the standards for that. So I think they're kind of making different arguments here. It may well be that suspension of the appeal and a remand for an evidentiary hearing will be necessary to properly resolve some of the serious claims raised by appellant in the motion he intends to file. There's another answer to a question we had off the top. Do they think we should have an evidentiary hearing? Do we think this should go back to the circuit court and pause the appeal? Sounds like the AG's office agrees, or at least is not fighting too hard, that we should have an evidentiary hearing in this case. I think we need it personally. I mean, as far as the public is concerned, this does not look good. We need to make sure things, things were done the right way for the worst of us so they'll be done the right way for the best of us. Objective investigation by SLED remains ongoing, but the inquiry has already revealed significant factual disputes as to the claims and appellant's motion. So there's another little zinger. Objective investigation by SLED, I think Murdoch's team would take issue with that, remains ongoing. But already in the very beginning, right off the jump, there are significant factual disputes as to the claims and appellant's motion. So that means they're not necessarily agreeing that even what Murdoch's team has put in their motion as fact is true. And there's going to be some discrepancies. And again, an evidentiary hearing before the judge could solve these problems. If no credible evidence can be found to support the claims by the appellant, the state will be prepared to argue against the motion before the Honorable Clifton B. Newman on remand. So what's interesting here, it says, if no credible evidence can be found to support Murdoch's claims, then the state will be prepared to argue against it. But you would say the inverse of that would also be true. If they do find credible evidence, if they do talk to these jurors who said that they were influenced or talked to or felt like the clerk felt a certain way and therefore subconsciously it made them feel that way, if they do find credible evidence of that, it sounds like maybe they won't even argue against a new trial. I think we know which side their investigation is going to come down on, but interesting, and that's the way a prosecutor should act. If they find problems in the case that it was not done right, his due process was trampled on, they should not argue against a new trial. And so I, I give them props for putting that in the motion. However, at present, appellant's request for a remand is procedurally defective. So this is some things that the public and lay people hate. And basically they're saying, forget about the merits of this motion. At this point, procedurally, it's defective. So before anybody can decide whether Murdoch is right or wrong or should win or lose this motion, they need to go back and fix problems. This happens literally all the time in litigation. A review of the motion does not reveal precisely when or how it is he learned of the claims he now raises, nor has appellant provided the affidavit required by DeAngelis. So what's interesting is we all know they're going to be able to provide the affidavit. We all know they're going to be able to provide the date after the trial that they found this new evidence. But even though we all know they can do that, they still have to do it if the rules require it. This is also something that maybe Murdoch's team won't even argue with. They'll say, okay, fine. Here's the appellant's affidavit, and here's the date we found the new evidence. Impossible to find during the trial or before the trial. Appellant's counsels have, however, made multiple statements to various media outlets indicating they were potentially aware of an issue with the jury at or about the time of trial. Uh, I want to hear what they mean by that. In a press conference on the steps of this court on September 5th, 2023, Counsel Harpulian responding to a question as to whether they saw the alleged conduct during the jury view or found out about it after the fact. He replies, I think we observed it. I was there. I watched it. So I think, again, this is where lawyers making arguments, as they're making the arguments, you can be like, oh, wow, that's a good argument. When we read their motion, you shouldn't lose to air, 
right? For a sports analogy, if you're playing against air and the receiver can't, you know, make a player catch the ball, it's like, what are you going to do when somebody's actually guarding you and there's defense up there and there's pushback? Well, they should win against air and kind of sounds like they're winning against air. I think we observed it. I was there. I watched it. But if I was Harpootlian, who's much more experienced than I am, but I would say, yeah, we saw them walking together. We didn't see the conversations or we didn't know what they were talking about, right? It's one thing to see something and not know that it's actual evidence. There's almost no way in my mind that they win on the factors of they should have known this during or before the trial. The only factor I think they have a chance of winning is if the court finds that they need to show that whatever this new evidence is would probably create a different result because I don't think they're doing that. And to say, as we're discussing this part of the litigation, like whether or not they should have this evidence you're hearing or a new trial is not to say Alec Murdoch is innocent. It's not to say he's not guilty. It's just to say there were problems and the court clerk having any influence or discussion about the case with the jury, we need to have a new trial regardless of if we think it's going to be a new outcome. I don't think we need to believe there's going to be a new outcome in order to have a new trial under these circumstances. It's very different than some other areas where new evidence is found that we discussed earlier. So you can let me know in the comments if you think that that quote from Harpootlian meant he knew about this before the trial ended. Later, at that same press conference, when a reporter asked if they approached the jurors or vice versa, Griffin replied that immediately in the aftermath of the verdict, we had received information that we needed to look into what happened in the jury room. In one interview with Good Morning America on September 6, 2023, Counsel Griffin stated, soon after the trial, actually, as soon as the verdict was rendered, we had gotten some indication from folks in the courtroom that there was something untoward that had happened in the jury room. We didn't know exactly what, um, and we went on a campaign to find out. Accordingly, the state is compelled to move to dismiss due to the procedural defect. Uh, the state would request the court grant appellant leave of 10 days to correct the procedural defect and establish precisely what and how it is he first learned of these allegations. In the event appell appellant properly files, remand may be necessary for the trial judge, the Honorable Clifton B. Newman, to consider the credibility of the claims in light of the significant factual disputes which undermine the credibility of the claims. So a couple things there right at the end. Number one, they're trying to argue they knew right after what took so long. Well, I think they made it clear. They went around. They tried to talk to all the jurors. Some jurors would talk to them. Some wouldn't. You don't have to jump on it the very first one because you know what's going to happen. They're going to say it's not credible. Jurors have differences. So they wanted to make sure they had everything, meaning Murdoch's team, that they could put together in a credible, appropriate way with affidavits and statements made and give it to the court and ask for their relief. The fact that people said, oh, this wasn't right, stuff was going on in the jury room, that happens in a lot of trials and turns out to not be true or fake news or you can't get credible evidence, which is what the state is going to ask for and what they should ask for. So I just see no way they win that, oh, you should have known about this earlier. Because I think if they should have, could have known about this earlier, I think they did a lot of discovery knocking on doors. People, you know, in the comments said they don't even think they should have done that. But they were doing their investigation to try and find and see if this new evidence even existed. But multiple times, they say, give them leave, let them fix this procedural defect in 10 days, which I think they could easily fix in 10 days. I don't think that's going to be a problem or make them lose because of the procedural defect. I do agree with the AG's office. They probably do need to have an affidavit for Murdoch and they need to state when they actually found out about the new evidence, which I think is going to be different times, you know, when they talk to different jurors. But another thing that they put in here multiple times, and it's a certain name, they say, maybe this does need to be remanded and held before Clifton B. Newman. Do you think the AG's office think it's going to be better or worse for them to have this motion or this evidentiary hearing in front of Clifton Newman. Do you think they think it's going to be a positive or negative for Alec Murdoch to have this evidentiary hearing in front of Clifton Newman and why? Now, it's very likely that it would happen before New uh, Newman because it's September 16th when I'm recording this, so he's still going to be the judge for another couple months, and it's not like this evidentiary hearing should be kicked out six months. It sounds like they have everything, although the AG's office said SLED's investigation is ongoing. So how long do they need to investigate that? And then is Murdoch's team going to have an opportunity to respond to SLED's investigation and whatever facts SLED comes up with to re-interview the jurors or see if they can find out any more information? Now, sometimes that can take can uh, make delays, 
And will that delay it two and a half, three months? Plus we have the holidays and all these other trials that are being set. All the other trials that Harpoolian and Griffin have already put on record the last uh, video that we did on the Murdoch hearing. So will Murdoch's team try to delay it enough to where it, maybe it won't be in front of Clifton Newman? Do they think Clifton Newman is bad for their client? They maybe indicated that in the uh, status conference that we watched together. So a lot of things moving around, but I think we did get a few answers here. I think we got the fact that the AG's office does not agree with the facts. They think they're going to be discrepancies. They want to do their investigation and they're going to bring their own facts to the table to show that there was no jury tampering. And that's their plan, I think. I think number two, they, found, they may try to argue if there was jury tampering, it would not have changed the outcome by some of uh, Murdoch's own affidavits. And it's not likely to change the outcome in the future. I think Murdoch's team is going to change, can argue that's not the standard. But number three, I think the AG's office kind of wants to have an evidentiary hearing as well to put this to bed. If they really have evidence that this is not true, they want to protect this verdict in the public's eye and legally. So I don't think they're going to shy away from an evidentiary hearing. And I think we're moving towards an evidentiary hearing happening. And number four, we found out SLED's doing the investigation. Number five, they want to have this hearing in front of Clifton Newman. So we got a lot of answers in this response. Let me know what questions you still have in the comments. And don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to, our subscribe to our page. And I hope you enjoyed the Saturday special. But I got to go watch the Knowles, hopefully put a thumping on BC, even though the weather is apparently not very good out there. Hopefully you guys have a good weekend. Until next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who might be interested here on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. You can also follow us on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, at Lawyer You Know. But on Instagram, we are still at Tragos Law. So look us up on there. And don't forget to listen to The Lawyer You Know podcast, available on all major podcast platforms. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us lawyer you know at gmail.com of course all of these links i just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode so until next time this is peter tragos the lawyer you know